Puzzles. For some of us, it's the reason why we like true crime. For us, we like to solve the mysteries and piece things to piece things together. I do warn people that sometimes we try and make puzzles out of something that aren't, but in the case I want to talk about this afternoon, it definitely is a puzzle, and that is the Robert Wan case. I'm here with the host of the Consult podcast and a former FBI profiler, Julia Cowley. Thank you for having me, Michael. I appreciate it. Yep. So I guess, so you've started a, a, a series on the Robert Wan case on the podcast. I guess how many episodes are you are you planning on doing? I'm not sure. We have gone through the whole case. We've done all the recordings, but we're still in the editing process and splitting up the different sessions that we had. What we typically do is we typically record three or four hours at a time and then split them up. And so I'm not sure exactly. It's probably going to be between six and eight. And we just released part three today. Okay. Yep. I've I've listened, so we may cover that. We will see. So first, can you uh, give us, uh, everybody that, that hasn't, but probably everybody that's listened has heard it, but could you give it the one-minute elevator pitch of what happened that day? Sure. So Robert Wan was a Washington, D.C. attorney, and on the evening of August 2nd of 2006, he planned to work late. So he made arrangements to stay at the home of a college friend by the name of Joe Price. And the college friend lived in the DuPont Circle area of Washington, D.C., which is a very nice area, fairly safe area, at the address of 1509 Swan Street Northwest, which I think has kind of become one of those iconic addresses for true crime cases. So Robert arrives at the home at about 10 30 p.m at 11 39 p.m joe price's domestic partner victor zaborski makes a call to 911 telling the 911 operator that someone in their home had been stabbed emts arrive and they find that robert ron has been stabbed three times and he is on the pull-out couch in the guest room and shortly after that, they yeah. transport him to the hospital where he's pr pronounced dead. Okay, well, thanks for the summary. And I guess getting back to my theme about puzzles, I think the number one or biggest puzzle in my mind, I think everybody's probably, I guess, is, is the stabbing itself and how, because it's just a big mystery. And that's what limits so many of the other potentials of what could have happened, just because it's a weird stabbing for a couple of reasons. One is that Robert doesn't seem to have moved at all. Like it, I, I, we can talk about the stab wounds and you can give more into that, but it doesn't seem like there was no like indication in the wounds that he moved while he was being stabbed um, or that he got up and then there was the fight moved somewhere else and got stabbed somewhere else. There's no indication of that. And then also with, with the stabbing too, that the like talk about it is the lack of, or the, the blood loss that was that there was a lot of blood loss but when we look at the bed where the, the of the scene sorry i may be rushing a little bit that it looks less than what you would see from a nosebleed so those are the two biggest puzzles in my mind uh going into it because i mean you could think of this like like if it was normal like maybe the three of them got to the got to the kitchen they had a fight or something got stabbed and then they stabbed them and put them in the bedroom but that doesn't appear to be like the case here. So talk. let's talk about a little bit about the stab wounds. I know several of the other uh, podcasts or whatever have covered it, but there was three symmetrical stab wounds, correct? Correct. And I think that every single show, podcast, article, what have you, when they cover the case, they bring up the very same things you're bringing up the the wounds there were three stab wounds to the front of robert and what was so extraordinary extraordinary about those wounds is that they were all exactly alike in terms of their angles and their depth that they went into robert 
and it was very apparent. And, and this is one of the things in the case that I think remains undisputed. There's some other evidence, and, and I'm sure we'll get into more of the puzzles that are out there, but there's disputes and there's two sides. They have the defense version and the prosecution version. But I think one of the things everyone agrees about is that e the, each of these wounds are exactly the same, which would indicate that Robert didn't move at all when he was stabbed. And I think those of us that have worked violent crime scenes certainly could understand if there was maybe one stab wound and, you know, that was different. And then two others were symmetrical, like the first one killed him and the second two, they were inflicted and he couldn't move. And so they were very similar, but to have all three. So the initial stabbing, there's just absolutely no indication that he moved. There's no tearing. There's no, mm. I, I mean, they're just the precision. It, it was, um, it's incredible. So and, yeah, and then and the you, other, go ahead. Sorry. And the other thing, there's no defensive. I mean, you would think that your body's natural reaction the first time you get stabbed is you're going to reach. I think you talked about it is you're going to try and grab the, the hands or the, the knife that's that came out of you. And you would think there'd be some cuts on your hands if you accidentally grabbed the knife as it was being plunged in and out. So, and, and there's no indications of any of that type of wounds, is there? There's no indication. Not only are there not any indication indications of defensive wounds on his hands, as we, we, we spoke with a prosecutor in this case, Glenn Kirshner, who prosecuted the three individuals who resided in the home. He prosecuted them for obstruction of justice and ev evidence tampering. But he told us there was absolutely no blood on his hands either. So no defensive wounds. Now, what I will say about defensive wounds is that not every stabbing death results in a victim having defensive wounds. It could be if a victim is surprised or they're stabbed from behind or somehow they don't have an opportunity to react. So I think I could get by the no defensive wounds. I just have a really hard time getting by the fact that whatever the initial stab wound was to Robert, there's no indication that his body reacted in any way to it. So it, it is un unusual. And you would think if he saw it coming, especially in the front, he might have had a chance to react and, and maybe even grabbed at it, but there's no indication. And, and um, so that just tells me at the very least he was not expecting it. He did not see that mm -hmm. this was coming. And at, that's at the very least. And at the worst, he was perhaps immobilized in some way, shape, or form. Yeah, correct. I mean, and I mean, and sorry, sorry. Um, there was no way that they think that that first stab wound was like fit, like he was like dead right after that wound was there. I guess they talk about the the blood being still in the body, still kind of being the stomach, kind of does something with it. So it indicates. That the that the he was still alive and processing like after that first stab wound, so I mean I think you could understand it if the first stab wound got you, and then like you stabbed again afterwards that would explain it. But it looks like he was still alive after that first the first right. Wound. That's the medical expert's opinion is that those stab wounds were inflicted while he was still alive, that he was not already dead or killed by some other means. Okay, one question I can't remember, and I wanted to ask you: Was, sure. was there was he wearing a shirt? Yes. Like, was he was okay? And there was was there three indications of wound or of a knife going through that shirt? Yes. So I'll clarify that he was found in a shirt. So I, I think there is perhaps some debate whether or not he, he was wearing the shirt when he was stabbed, and perhaps maybe the person put the shirt back on him. So. That I want to make clear. I think he probably was wearing his shirt when he was stabbed, but there is some debate about that. But yes, so there were three holes in the shirt that corresponded to the three stab wounds in the front of his chest and okay, because, stomach. Uh, it was in the chest and stomach area where he oh, was. Okay. Mm -hmm. So because a lot of people speculate, I mean, one of the ways that they could have done it to get rid of the blood loss is stab him like in the shower. And then, like, the, the blood could have gone down the drain. But I don't understand how they could have, like, stabbed him, moved the body, and then put a shirt back on him 
and then stabbed him three times to court, like in the shirt to make it look like it went through. That just seems kind of weird to me. Would, right. Is that a possibility? Well, I don't think so. Just because I think it would take a lot of effort to put him in the shower, move him, it's especially the fact that he's, he's would be very heavy. It would be cumbersome. It would make a mess. And there was just no signs in the crime scene that there was any kind of cleanup whatsoever. And the other thing was there were a, a number of samples throughout the home taken for, and, and tested for blood, including the the traps, the drain traps. And there was no indication that blood had gone down the drains. There was no indication of blood anywhere in the home other than on the bed, the blood you mentioned being on the bed. And that was from when he was being put on the gurney and he was turned over by medical personnel. Oh, I guess I hadn't heard that. I guess I thought I just assumed that the blood there was like from the stabbing. So you think it was from the, when they moved him that like it turned over, over and some of the blood just came out from being turned over. Yeah. Very likely. It, it, it is likely that it was because the, the stab wounds were not through and through. So he didn't bleed in his back area. And I think it's our opinion just a after looking at all the evidence that he was likely stabbed on that bed and not moved from somewhere else just because of the lack of blood or indication of any struggle in any part of the home at all. It, it and in in this home the the three individuals that live there and I I should clarify that it was Joe Price and his domestic partner Victor Zaborski so so Joe was Robert's friend Victor was Joe's domestic partner and was the one who made the 911 call and then they had another roommate Dylan Ward who was part of the family unit that they had, but he also had a sexual physical relationship with Joe Price. So they lived together. Mm -hmm. They lived together as a family. And in within this home, it was noted to be just absolutely pristine, clean, everything organized, everything put away, their spices and their, their food in their kitchen was organized alphabetically. So these were very meticulous people who lived in the home. So anything out of place would have been noticed. So we're left with this mystery. What happened? Yeah. Did they clean this up in a, a relatively short period of time? Or what could be another explanation? And during our show that we, when we covered on the consult, we go through and talk through all possible scenarios that we can think of like could this have happened could this have happened yeah. and we talk it all through which is exactly how we do real consults in the fbi what you hear is exactly what would be going on in the room in a consult when we were back in the behavioral analysis unit so it's i think we like to talk through all the different possibilities to see okay, what makes sense? And then if one of us has an idea or a theory, another one can think of, you know, maybe why that theory doesn't make sense. It's it's a team process, but we do go through it trying yeah. to think, okay, how did this happen? Was there a tarp that he was killed on? Glenn, the prosecutor had said that at one point they had a baby pool, like a plastic baby pool at least witnesses said they had something like that at one point in time, but during the searches, they never found it. So, yeah, but I, that would be really hard to hide in four in in 30 minutes though. I mean, that's one of the things. Again, I mean, I mean, you can't just throw it behind the fence because it looks behind the fence. I mean, the, mm -hmm. I mean, I know, I know from watching the, the NBR, the Peacock um, documentary, there was a sandbox like in the back that was, a, I don't know if it looked like a turtle or something. I can't remember. I mean, they couldn't have done it in there and then filled it with sand. I mean, it's just it's not. Po I just don't think it was possible unless they're really you're, unless you're absolutely they're right. a fourth person. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right. That the time frame is too short a time to. And let's let's say for you know argument's sake 
that there was a tarp or there was a pool and then he killed him. That's how they contain the blood. Well, then what do you do with it? Where did that go? And they did scour the dumpsters up and down the alley behind the home. And yeah. they, they were there. I think there's a little bit, maybe some people have the misconception that the crime scene wasn't processed, wasn't processed well, but it was processed very well. They were there for weeks looking for okay. things. And so it wasn't, I mean, as far as I can tell from an outsider looking in, I, I think they did a very thorough job. And not only that, after the Metropolitan Police Department processed the scene, the FBI evidence response team went in and also processed the scene, trying to use potentially other chemicals to maybe locate blood. And yeah. one of my colleagues on the consult was a member of that team. So she also saw what was done in terms of the processing of the scene. Okay, so one question I had, uh, was this all hardwood, like, in the entire apartment? Yes. So that makes it a little easier. I mean, carpet would have been impossible to clean up, but at least hardwood. Yep. But but if but if they used rags or towels, they would have had to get rid of those, too. So it's just, like, you not, not in the dumpsters, or they they had a neighbor they could give it to, and that, I don't think so. I and mean, it is the biggest puzzle. Yeah, when you start adding in other people become part of the conspiracy, it becomes higher risk and more likely you'll be found out. So I mean, all these things are good things you're bringing up. You're right. If they did clean up blood on the hardwood floor or, or spat or somewhere, then where do they get rid of those towels? And I mean, it, it, it it's always possible that they ran out, threw it into a dumpster and the police just didn't find it or somebody took it out it's possible, but mm -hmm. is it likely? I don't think it's likely. Okay. So let's, I guess, let's shift a little bit. Another puzzle is since he didn't, um, uh, since he didn't uh, react to the stabs, we believe that he was under a, a paralytic. So let's talk about it. I don't remember the name of the drug because it was, it's kind of hard to pronounce maybe. Uh, succinylcholine. So, succinylcholine. So I guess what do you, I mean, uh, I, I won't even try. I'll, so what do you know about that drug? Uh, what have you learned about that drug over the time investigating this case? Well, I don't know a lot about it in terms of it being like a drug of abuse. So in my past life, before I joined the FBI, I was a forensic scientist and I was a toxicologist. So right up my alley, <laughs> it, so to speak. Yeah. And so... I understand the drug testing that was done. And we did talk with the prosecutor at length about which drugs were tested for. And it's it's my understanding that toxicology was not able to test for the succinylcholine or they felt like it wouldn't still be present because of how long it would last in the body. I, I'm not familiar with succinylcholine in the same way I'm familiar with your regular types of drugs of abuse or medications. And so what the medical examiner did is they tested for, they did a, a drug screen where they tested for different classes of drugs. And none of your typical drugs that you would see mm -hmm. came up in that drug screen. Now, when we talked with the prosecutor, he said that blood was forwarded to a, to a, a, a toxicologist who did further testing for sp specific types of drugs because in a drug screen there are certain drugs unless you're specifically looking for them they're not going to show up mm, in a regular yeah. drug screen drug screen so it's he couldn't recall exactly what drugs were tested for but it it did appear in the documents that at least certain types of drugs that you would consider to be potentially what we know as date rape drugs were tested for but succinylcholine was not. So that became yeah. the, the drug that was suspected to have been used. Now, how would they have gotten that? I'm not quite sure. I don't know how yeah. readily available or how it was um, monitored back then. If you could just go in somewhere and grab yeah. it off a crash cart or something. 
So it, it is a mystery. We don't know what immobilized him. Uh, yeah, I guess what, I mean, it's, that is very confusing too, because you would think that if, that if you were using it before, I mean, I'm not sure you'd use a new drug like that, like out of nowhere. Like, I don't know how they would have decided, oh, somebody's coming over. Let's go get a paralytic drug right off of the, off the, off of a crash cart and then use it. I mean, I would, I would think that maybe in that, I mean, I guess you always worry about being, dr or being drugged like at a, at a bar or something, but that would be the normal date rape drugs. You would think they might have experimented or used those in the past, but this one sounds like out of out of ordinary. So I don't even do you know how they came up with this one? Like who brought it up or who how this this type of this specific drug was thought of being used? I don't know who originally suspected that could be the drug i think i'm sure as a team of investigators and prosecutors they did research and talked with experts and toxicologists and basically asking okay what kind of drug could render some someone completely immob immobile so that's my guess is how they kind of came up with that and then also not only a drug that would be render someone completely immobile but a drug that would go undetected as well. Correct. Yeah. It, but we don't know. Like, we yeah. just don't know. It's, it's very baffling. I, I don't know how it was done. All I know is that I believe he had to be immobilized in some way. And he had no evidence of injury of having been bound or tied or somehow held down there were no injuries because if they had done that i think there would be signs that there was a struggle you might have well the only thing about him, though the only thing that i wondered if it was possible if you know some of those the handcuffs that that could be used are really like the hair and the furry kind is there any chance that that could have been masked and he could have been handcuffed with something that was a little bit softer well yes Th that is possible. However, he his body would still react. And we talk we actually talk about this and about potentially if he had been bound and we talk about how it's almost impossible to keep someone from moving. And one yeah. of my colleagues had worked a previous homicide and, and the victim was bound to a bedpost and was stabbed and she described how he bent the bed post be, be, because of the reaction he had to the stabbing, fighting it. So that just shows you how strong the body will react. And there's just no indication that he did. Correct. And those things, I mean, you're right. Something's going to give either the handcuff or that bed post or something would normally give or the body would, it still would give you normally enough slack to move a little bit. Yeah. So, and and yeah. the injury would reflect it. It would reflect that it wasn't precise as the others were. Okay. There, there would be some indication in the injury itself. I would think. I guess then let's get into the, the puncture marks because that's, sorry, let's uh, get into the, the puncture marks. I guess that's been always a kind of a mystery too, just that, uh, when they took him in um, to try and revive him or whatever, and they used several places to put IV lines. I guess Glenn questioned how many of the puncture marks were done by the ER or by the EMTs or ER, whatever. Is that correct? Yes. So according to the prosecution, they could not account for any of the puncture marks except for one. However, that was not the finding of the judge. They, there were numerous attempts to try to revive him. Um, I, I don't think the personnel, the medical personnel could say, oh, I definitely did this. I mean, it's possible, but there were, there were efforts to revive him as you would expect. He was taken from the home to the hospital during that whole time they're doing or attempting life-saving measures on him. And so you would expect that they would they wouldn't try just one time. 
with you know, you're trying to get a line. And so it, it does appear that several of those puncture marks are accounted for. I don't know that every single one was, but I tend to believe that it's most likely that those puncture marks were the result of medical intervention. Okay. I know there's one like that wasn't accounted for in the foot or what between the toes, like, like a normal, I mean, you would think maybe a heroin user might use that part of the body, but it just seems so weird that you would think of using it. I mean, I guess that's an other in the mystery is like, if you were choosing this drug, I mean, you'd have to have some knowledge of the drug before. If you know that, Oh, I could, I could use a needle mark in the middle of a foot and it would still work. I mean, I Did guess you would have to have some knowledge of how that, that drug worked and how you would have to get it into the system to do it. I mean, that's why it's so strange because it's right. not like it's not a date rate drug that's in a, in a pill form or something you could add the water or something. It's you'd have to have a needle and you'd have to know how many, or how many milliliters of it or whatever to try and do something. So you, I mean, I you would at least think that if someone we're going to do that and administer a drug like that for nefarious purposes. They would have at least done some research on it, perhaps used it before to the extent of their experience. I don't know, but at the very least, like you said, some sort of research of how is this, how do I do this? How is this going to affect the victim? Is it going to work the way I want it to work? Yeah. So these are all things you would think someone would be asking prior to engaging in, in that activity. Or it would be, or it would be known throughout like the clubs that they went to that they wouldn't, I mean, you could get information that way knowing, Hey, what are, what do people use or what, what do I got to worry about? Like when I go to a a gay club or whatever, and you might be, well, you got to be worried about these drugs and they'll put them in your, in your alcoholic drink or whatever, but not this one. So. I mean, it's just very strange. It is I guess very I, strange. Okay, let's uh, let's go with one. I think that both of us have thrown out just, but just to get over it, is the intruder. I did have one that somebody asked about: Could they have gotten into the apartment from the roof? Um, have you ever seen that? Ever, <laughs> or in this, no, like in this case? In this so case, the only time I see. Ever- I don't Go think ahead. any, I don't think that that would have been possible without okay. having, you know, they'd still have to like jump over the fence. And I, I don't know that that would be possible. At least you'd have to scale the front of the house or jump over the back fence and then scale up. And I, I'm not sure exactly if there's any way from the roof. I, I have no knowledge of that, but I, Okay. I'm sure that it, I'm sure they were considering every possible way they could have entered and they just they didn't see that. But you have to remember as well that the defendants in this case who were acquitted by the way, I should say that they were acquitted and they yeah, maintained their and they've maintained their innocence obviously. But you have to remember that they did it indicate that the intruder came through the back door that that was the point of entry because they heard the door chime and that okay. they knew for a fact the front door was locked it was reported to police by the defendants or at least one of them that the front door was definitely locked so it wasn't through the front door the rear door might have been left unlocked based on their interviews and what they told police so And then with the evidence or with the statements they made about hearing the door chime, that would just indicate that they they likely, an intruder likely did, if if it is an intruder, came through the back door. And I think that's the only way. And there's also, they did have a basement apartment, but you couldn't, there's not a separate entrance to the basement apartment either. So at the time when they alleged, or when they said that they heard the door chime, they thought it could be their downstairs tenant okay and there was no indication that the guy went out the front door is there so they so they're thinking i mean according to them 
it was it was backdoor and backdoor for entry and exit. Yes, and they, according they to them. Yeah, see, according to them. Here. I see coming in the back door, but I guess you. I would think you'd just run out the closest one after stabbing someone. Normal. I mean, I guess. But I mean, and and the, the thing that I mean, if you would plan to kill somebody in the room, like you think, why? I mean, why would they? There would be no reason that they went after Robert. You would think, like, if there was a plan to kill somebody in one of those rooms, it would have been one of the three. I mean, there would have been no way for somebody to know that. Oh, they're having a guest tonight. Oh, let me go after the guest now. I mean, that's. I don't even think you'd see that in a plot of a F or a CIA or whatever type movie. It, that'd be just even too crazy for that. It certainly doesn't make any sense. So if somebody were just going there for the sole purpose of killing somebody, why not just go to the first check the first door, the first room they come to, which would have been Dylan's room. That's his room was at the top of the stairs. So his room would have been the first room you would have come to. And so why not check that? It doesn't mean that they bypassed that room and went to the room at the front of the house. It doesn't mean that, but it's just something you're considering when we're weighing all the, the evidence that would suggest an intruder came into the house. I mean, we, we absolutely have to consider that. And we have to consider how it would be possible, what's most likely, what's least likely to happen. You know, it's all kind of based on probabilities, what most likely happened. Yeah. But I mean, there's a point, I guess, where you, if something is outrageous, you might have to convince, might have to consider some of the smaller possibilities. But still, I think there's much larger probabilities of what happened. We just don't understand the sequence of events. And right. so, I mean, I get, and the next one, I guess. This is one maybe you're going to get in the further episodes, so maybe we'll have to table it. Is is trying to understand the the like the other one is the biggest why, um, because like one of them, Scott, like you hear a friend is coming over, so I mean you're either going to say okay, well, I mean he's coming over to stay the night, but then somebody's got to say well, let's let's do something more with him. That just seems like to me, I think that just seems really weird too, but. I mean, or, I mean, maybe there's some, I mean, so you told me that the three of them are, I think it was only the two of them that went downstairs to meet him, right? So the yes, story I'm not is, sure if I, if I said that, I mean, we've, I, we, that's been covered on our podcast and I think that it's well known based on the evidence that Joe and Dylan were the ones, and this is based on their statements to police. They went downstairs and greeted Robert. Well, I actually, I, I back up. I believe Dylan went downstairs first, greeted Robert, and then Joe came down. And then they went into the kitchen where they had a glass of water and chatted for a bit. And then they all went upstairs and, and went to bed in their separate rooms. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's what you had said earlier. But somehow, and I guess this is more from when, as a profiler or understanding human behavior is, when did it change or how did it change? I guess that's one of the other big puzzles of this, the, of right. what or did it like, change? or did it change? That's the big question. Did everything go to plan to a certain point? Did they plan to greet Robert, go upstairs, come back down, murder him? I mean, we, we, we don't know. I'm just, I'm throwing that out there as, you know, what went wrong? What happened? Was this, purposeful did they want this to happen and this to be the outcome or did something go wrong and robert was killed but motivation was not to kill him or is it an intruder these are all the things and what i will say is that even though i think many people would look at this case and say that an intruder is the least likely thing to have happened. That, intru that an intruder came in and killed Robert. But I will say that we have seen the strangest cases at BAU where you think you have all the answers and you're just completely floored. Mm -hmm. And I want to remind people, if anyone's seen the documentary or read the book, well, the, the documentary is 
American Nightmare. The book is Victim yeah. F. It's it's an incredible story, and nobody believed them, and until they found the the perpetrator. So I think everyone who heard that story just thought it was too incredible to believe, and it made no sense. And in in that case, I don't think the police ever really looked for evidence of an intruder. In in that case, they did in the Robert Wan case. But I always want to put out there that I've seen the strangest things in my career. So we may have an opinion as to what most likely happened and what's most probable. But I will tell you, profiling criminal behavior is is not an exact science. So in every single report we would write in the FBI, we say this is not an exact science. And you know, it's based on probabilities and it's based on our own experience and training and education and all of that. And so we could be wrong. That's what I want to say. So I just I mean, don't yeah, yeah. So I, well, I mean, I mean, I, we all want an answer in the end, but unfortunately, if it's what most of us think, there's never, I mean, unless one of the three finally decide to uh, tell us what happened, we'll probably never know. So I hope so. I hope. I never give up hope. I've seen stranger <laughs> things as well. You see, you know, every day you see somebody, DNA made a match or somebody confessed on their deathbed or you have to remember well, I mean, yeah, no, sorry. Relationships so, I mean, yeah. Change. You know, people well, have, you know, over years, relationships change and people's motives for keeping quiet are no longer valid for them. And they may want to come forward for various reasons. And, it, it, and sometimes it happens at the when you least just expect it. I have yeah, I guess I always, it's, you know, no, hell yeah. I mean, I guess if something happened, maybe the victor and Joseph would be a possibility if they split up, maybe, maybe that might be something that could come through. But I guess, I mean, the other mystery or one of the other puzzles too, is three people. I mean, as they say, two people knowing a secret, you want to make sure that there's only one of them. Right. But three is really hard to keep a secret, but we have three here. So maybe one of them will tell. We, we do. We have three people, which goes to you, you, I mean, you have to wonder. You know, it's, nothing has come out in all of these years from any of them. Is it possible that th this was done by an intruder? And we're all, we, we just don't understand the evidence, or we're we're wrong in this case. I, I think. I think we always have to ask ourselves, no matter what, we have strong opinions about something, but I always think it's a good idea to step back and ask yourself, what if I'm wrong? It's just a good check, <laughs> check yourself. And then if you're found to be wrong, it's not so painful. Okay. I, I just had a couple of more questions and then we'll probably uh, finish up. I guess um, do you know of any of the thing, items that were like suppressed going into the, uh, like the trial that uh, weren't brought up? I know for one was the number of like the amount, the number and the graphics of the toys of the, the BDSM material, but the, the judge decided that would be more prejudicial than probative. So she kept it out for herself. So do you know if there is anything more that was maybe done that would help knowing it or was not brought up at trial? So at trial, they were not allowed or there was no evidence presented of sexual assault and there was no evidence presented that Robert was drugged or potentially drugged. Those, those two things were kept out of the trial. Okay. That the second one was much bigger. And I guess, I mean, to me, I think this would have been a much easier case if it had gone to the jury. I think we would have, mentally put the more things together i think if they had gone with a jury trial they would have lost the jury would have found something to convict him of but i guess that's an episode by itself potentially yeah i it's hard to know if 
I'm sure that now the prosecution wishes they had been in front of a jury, but unfortunately that was not what happened in the case. Okay. Um, was there any, I've talked about several of my puzzles in here. Is there any puzzles or anything that you want mysteries that you want to bring up? Oh, let's we see. About? Well, what other cases are you fascinated by? What's your, what's your other, <laughs> like if you had to pick one case, what would be the one? Because I've been asked that before and it's almost impossible because there are cases that I've worked on that I would love to see solved, but to try to prioritize which one of those I would want to have solved over the other, I'm not sure I can do that. And so then I start to think about cases that I've never worked on and okay, which one of those cases would I want to see solved? It's almost an impossible question. Which one? Correct. Well, I guess, I mean, you've covered it. I live about like 30 minutes from the John Bonet house, but I go by that neighborhood all the time. I've never seen the house. So, but I go near it and actually I'm probably the one person in Boulder that wasn't invited to that house that morning. So no, I'm joking, oh, but I was, I was, I was, I mean, how, I mean, they, they asked a well, lot you're of people right. to come over. I mean, yeah, there was a lot. That's for sure. Correct. So I was a college yeah. student at the time. I would have been on Christmas break. So I would have been probably one of the families, one of my families at the time. So I don't remember where I was for that exact Christmas, but. I mean, the dorms are not that far from the house, probably within a mile of directly. So, but mm -hmm. yeah, I go by it and wonder that one. That one would be a good one to know. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree. That would be one of my top cases as well. Uh, Zodiac would be another top case of mine. I mean, for years, the offender Joe D'Angelo, who had been known as the East Area Rapist, original Night Stalker, and then ultimately the Golden State Killer. That was one of the cases at the top of my list as well. But now we know that one. So, um, but yeah, there's there's so many out there. And they keep happening. Unfortunately, people still commit murder. So, yeah. But so I did want to bring up as a shout out for somebody that was asking on the gallery was um her name was um, Sandy. Let's see. Let me make sure. Chapman, and she wanted to know, I guess, similar, was that if you could have worked on any case, which one would you have done? I think I would want to work. I'm sorry, I'm taking I'm taking so long to answer because I'm really thinking about this. It's and okay. I think my answer, I think my answer is going to depend. I th would have liked to be working at the John Bonet Ramsey crime scene. I, f I feel, I mean, knowing what I know now and the training that I had at the time, and and I, you know, had very good training with the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation. They were an accredited lab long before the FBI was ever accredited. So we just we were taught very good skills. And so I would have liked to have been on a, in my crime scene team with the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation and, and processed that home and, and at least it maybe even been a first responder to make sure let's just keep everybody out right now. Something like that. You know, if you, you, you think about oh, hindsight is twenty twenty. If I could go back, I would do things differently. And I think we all know that in that case. Yeah. Yeah. The, the other case I think is very fascinating is the Zodiac is just another one at the top of my list. I would like to take a look at that one at some point. And I, I don't believe it was a case that was ever looked at by the FBI's behavioral analysis unit. So that's, I've just always been fascinated with, with that one as well, particularly because I always think it's very interesting when offenders communicate with law enforcement or, they draw attention to themselves with communicating either with law enforcement or the press. I, I find that to be interesting. Or how about the one that everybody brings up? And when they say this crime, when the, we don't know a crime, he always gets blamed as Israel keys. Israel I keys. Well, I, I did work on Israel keys. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's I, okay. I, that's okay. What did you, oh, I, 
that'd be a whole nother episode by itself too. Like, it is. A, it's a whole nother episode. I, I did. I, I worked on the, yeah, I worked on the, the two cases that had come into the BAU, the couriers. We worked on that one. And then it was, it was, was it a year later, Samantha Koenig in Alaska, she went missing and we were working on that. And I will tell you, we had the kind of the same group of people working on both those cases and we had no idea they were connected until keys was arrested and they were interviewing him and he said well i i kidnapped a couple in vermont and they start they call vermont and they find out there's a missing couple and then we get the news that he's saying he did he killed them and we were floored that was probably one of the like when I say you've seen I've seen the strangest things that we were shocked that they were connected because I don't think just based on victimology, based on the geography of how far apart you can't get much further apart. You yeah. Vermont, Alaska. You you really I mean, I guess you could get a little <laughs> further apart, but not much. We just never would have ever connected those cases if he hadn't confessed to the couriers, I, I don't think. Um, it, well, it's possible because there was some evidence at the courier's crime scene. So it's it's possible eventually they, they could have connected them with he left a fingerprint at the scene. So, yeah. Okay. Um, maybe we can do an episode later if uh, if you've enjoyed this talk. Maybe we can do uh, sure. one at Israel Happy Keys. To. Okay. We'll, yeah. we'll take some time and do that. And I just wanted to leave it off with what uh, – Getting back because she was so nice to respond to me what Shannon said, and I'm quoting or trying to quote from her. Um, you, she says she values your professionalism uh, that you and your team does with dealing and discussing cases. No ego, it's just facts and how they all work together. They've given you, her so much to think about on each of the cases she covered because of the totality of different questions and the information they asked for in the analysis. The latest episode on Robert Wong. Bringing in blog writers was genius. I honestly had so many questions on the dynamic there, and this answer in this episode answered many of them. So, seeing how the profiles take all of this from the outside info, and then and not make considerations based on that, but use it to round out the picture, and is so nuanced. I'm gushing, and that is what she said. So, I just wanted well, to give you some I'm good honored. feedback on. I am honored and. Thank you very much for that because that is exactly what we hope our show to be. And I'm complete. I'm just floored and honored. Thank you. That means a lot. Okay, yeah. I will tell her that, and I'll post it. She'll Please hopefully she'll watch it. the video. <laughs> yeah, tell her thank you. And huh, what can I say? That's what we hope okay. for. I do have an ego. Okay. I have a little bit of an ego. <laughs> I'm still trying. I mean, I'm still like, trying to figure out my uh, my show. I don't. I don't have an ego yet. I'm just trying to figure out if I fit I'm, in I'm somewhere. Kidding. Yeah. I mean, you, okay. you learn, you, you'll, you'll figure out as you go and you'll go back and you'll listen to your first episodes and you'll be like, Oh, I should redo that one. It, Cause we've evolved. Our show has evolved and you will as well. So and you'll, okay, you'll yeah, get I'm used still, to yeah. it. Yeah. yeah my know, format is, Oh, sorry. My format. Oh, I was like, going to say, go ahead. Sorry. My format is I do. I follow Charles live. So I give updates. I, I really followed the Nikolai Mew case. I'm not sure I agree with the outcome of that one. But um, I follow the cases, and then I give summaries each week of what happens. And then I do these long episodes of topics, either in the legal world or on true cases. So I think as long as you stick to what you're interested in, and you'll you'll find your way. And if, if it if you want to interview certain people, you have a case you're interested in or a topic, interview them. If there's a case you want to get on and talk about, as long as you have a passion for it, you'll figure out how you're going to do it, how it's going to work out. Not everyone's going to like everything that you do. Yeah. Trust me, you got to have a little bit of a thick skin. But uh, I mean, you know, I've had yeah. I was an FBI agent for 22 years. I can take criticism. <laughs> so you just so, get used oh. to it. And real quick, uh, do you know somebody, or you could? I want to know somebody that that understands how interrogations happen at the FBI. Their pot or their pluses and minuses, and their concerns, and how that works. So I wanted to talk to somebody about that because that's certainly something in true crime where definitely a lot of people believe false confessions happen 
all the time, how the FBI watches to make sure that doesn't happen. And, and are they overrated? Those are kind of the questions I would like to find somebody to talk to about. Yes, but, I do know so. experts in interrogation, particularly polygraphers. None of them speak publicly that I know of. So uh, okay. what I would, but, but I don't know. I mean, I could sort of ask around and see, but yes, I, I know several people, but I don't know if they would be public okay. about it. And they, but there's also other experts that are not in the FBI as well. I'm sure if we looked up people or Google people, we'd find some people with great credentials that have that experience that, that do talk to, you know, talk on podcasts and yeah. YouTube and stuff like that, that are comfortable with that. Yeah. But, and um, not charging, not charging by the hour. That's the hard part. Okay. Um, can I, <laughs> people, uh, I'm, I'm going to, do people charge? <laughs> I think there are some that charge that is that uh, like, for but. yeah. Yeah. We don't, I, I don't do that, but we do have a Patreon. So that's it. Just to keep the show just plugging along. Okay. I guess. If you want, yep. Just go ahead and uh, finish up. I'll let you uh, do one last plug for your uh, oh. podcast. Yep. So the consult, Real FBI Profilers. I'm the host, Julia Cowley, and I do this show with three other retired FBI profilers, Angela Surser, Susan Kostler Drew, and Bob Drew. And we talk about solved and unsolved cases on our show, all from a behavioral perspective. And we just started a new Patreon for listeners who love our show, want to support us, and they will get early access to our content just a few days, but ad-free. So at some point, as, as we get more experienced at what we're doing, we may add in and, and do some bonus things. But right now, I can't promise anything. So that's the plug for our show. Okay. okay thank you.